welcome you to the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center, and I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure as uh, the Dean of the Schulich School of Law to be able to welcome everyone here. My name is Camille Cameron, and it's a real pleasure to see everyone here for this special event. I will begin by thanking uh, Elder in Residence Debbie Eisen for the blessing and Eastern Eagle for performance of the honor song. Thank you very much. The event we're having here today is the first honorary degree ceremony during our bicentennial celebrations. It is wonderful to be having it in the community and to be sharing it with community members. I'm now going to call on the Provost and Vice President Academic of Dalhousie University, Dr. Carolyn Waters, to give opening remarks. Thank you, Dean Cameron. I hope I can speak loudly enough for those at the back. Um, good morning. To begin with, let me introduce the platform party. Uh, I'd ask people to stand when your name is called and remain standing until everyone is introduced. First, A. Ann McClellan, Chancellor of Dalhousie University. Dr. Kale, Dale Keith, Interim President and Vice Chancellor of Cape Breton University. Tuma Young, Unamaki College, Cape Breton University. The Honorable Michael McDonald, Chief Justice of Nova Scotia. Dr. Kevin Hewitt, Chair of Dalhousie Senate. Camille Cameron, Deal, uh, sorry, Dean Sulik Law, School of Law. Jennifer Llewellyn, Professor, Schulich School of Law. Naomi Metallic, Professor, Schulich School of Law. And Dr. Michael DeGagne, President of Nipissing University and today's honorary degree recipient, your platform party. So just a little note here. Uh, I bring uh, greetings from President Richard Florizone, who unfortunately is not uh, well today, so I'm here in his stead. Luckily, I have some notes from him, which I will cheerfully ad, ad lib to. So it is really an honor to be here today to recognize uh, Dr. de Gagne as our first special honorary doctorate that we are awarding as part of our bicentennial celebrations. Each one of these will be done in a special way at a special convocation such as the one today. And what a pleasure to start here in the Native Friendship Center. Dalhousie is proud to be one of Canada's first universities to celebrate its 200th uh, years as a university. Milestone, of course, gives us an opportunity to reflect on the first 200 years, but also to really start to dream and think about what our world could look like in the next 100 years. One of our guiding principles uh, as we plan for the last two years about how to celebrate this 200th anniversary was how to use the occasion to foster better uh, integration with our community, not just with our research, but by having events where we actually are in the community and the community realizes how welcome they are on our campus. And so uh, what a perfect example. So everyone uh, should be uh, keeping tune with a very busy schedule for the 200th anniversary. We've had a poem uh, written by George Eliot Clark, 35 pages, so I won't be reading it, but <laughs> he will be, and our, our launch is tomorrow. February 6th was the uh, actual date of the declaration uh, by Laura Dalhousie uh, of the starting of Dalhousie uh, University. There will be, uh, the new music has been made. Uh, we're commissioning a new uh, ceremonial object which will better reflect 
uh, the communities that are part of Nova Scotia and part of Dalhousie. So there will be kitchen parties and there will be speakers and there will be many, many events uh, over the, the 12 months of this year. So we welcome you all and uh, hope that you can really join us. Each one of our special honorary doctorates uh, will be unique and as I said before, uh, connected with the community that we're celebrating for that event. So Walilo uh, for having us here today. But we are very proud to recognize Dr. Degagne for the impact he has had in advancing reconciliation between the indigenous and non-indigenous peoples of our land. Um, as a founding executive director of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, as an academic whose expertise and research interests include Aboriginal post-secondary success, and as a teacher, including years at our very own Schulich School of Law. Dr. Degagne has been dedicated to education and leadership that we need uh, to truly have reconciliation. So one of the special features of this honorary uh, doctorate event is that we have also not only lunch, but an afternoon panel um, committed to discussing how we might achieve an advanced reconciliation in education. And their expertise includes people who are experts in anthropology, as well as law, political science, psychology, and nursing. So in this panel, we hope that everyone will uh, contribute and we will actually begin to see in action some of the principles that Dr. Degagne has dedicated his life to. Dalhousie is particularly honored uh, to, doctor, to award this degree this afternoon, given our institutional commitment and one of our strategic priorities to address truth and reconciliation, commissions calls to action. And I'm proud to say that our law faculty has really been a leader in this area at Dalhousie. So I'll just mention three. Uh, first, the establishment many years ago, I might check with the dean here, 28? 1989. So you can do the math. <laughs> Long-standing <laughs> Indigenous Black and Mi'kmaq initiative to increase the number of, of students from those two communities who, who are admitted to law and are successful in the law program. And I know we have some graduates here today. Secondly, the establishment of an ad hoc committee within the faculty to respond to the TRC reports, uh, recommendations. And they have committed to uh, new resources to build a collection of material that all instructors can use to, to integrate indigenous and aboriginal subject matter in their teaching across the campus. So finally, uh, I'd like to uh, give them credit. Uh, they've introduced a new first year course this year called Aboriginal and Indigenous Law in Context, where all students are introduced to Mi'kmaq people and Mi'kmaq culture in their first semester. The second semester explores then how law applies to and is applied by Indigenous people. So uh, we will surely hear more about this as, um, as these programs are unfolding. But Dr. finally, Dr. Degagne, thank you for your contributions to reconciliation and to education. And thank you for being here today with us today as we acknowledge our 200th anniversary, the work we've done, and the work we still need to do. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Dr. Waters. Um, Dr. Waters has indicated to you the things that make this particularly, particular honorary degree ceremony a little bit or a whole lot special. They are all special, and this one is special because, of course, we've chosen to have it here in this location. It's also special because, as Dr. Waters indicated, we are um, this afternoon uh, hosting a reconciliation in education symposium. We chose that particular topic, reconciliation in education, because it fits so well with Dr. Degagne's own commitments and contributions, which have been explained by Dr. Waters. Um, and of course, for the same reason, it makes such good sense that we're hosting that symposium here in this place. What better place to choose 
uh, in the community to honor um, uh, our honorary degree recipient and to host the Reconciliation in Education event. I'm very pleased that we'll be hosting the afternoon event in collaboration with Cape Breton University, and I want at this point to th th thank Professor Toomey Young and his colleagues at Cape Breton University for being such fine collaborating partners in this event. Thank you. Conferring an honorary do doctoral degree is the highest honor a university can bestow. I now call upon Dr. Kevin Hewitt, Chair of Senate, to present the candidate for the degree, Dr. of Laws, Honoris Causa. Good, after, good morning. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to describe some of the outstanding accomplishments uh, of our honorary degree recipient today, Dr. Michael Degonye. Dr. Michael Degonye has spent his entire career helping people and working to establish a vision and the conditions for reconciliation between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in Canada. Starting with his work with provincial and federal agencies and governments, including Indian and Northern Affairs Canada and Health Canada, and continuing as the founding executive director of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, his leadership has inspired hope and action for healing and reconciliation. Serving as President and Vice Chancellor of Nipissing University in North Bay, Ontario since 2013. And by the way, the first, he's the first Indigenous President of a Canadian Chartered University. Dr. Degonye imparts his belief that education is the key to a better world and an investment in one's personal future. Education, he, is, he insists, has the power to transform individuals and communities. To illustrate the power that education has had on his own life, Dr. Degonye likes to share the story of his father, who started out as a farmer and became an educator, pursuing his degree one course at a time in a church basement in Fort Francis, Ontario. Today, each of Dr. Degonye's siblings has a degree, as do all of their children. In addition to a Bachelor of Science in Biology, degree from the University of Toronto, he holds a Master's Degree in Administration from Central Michigan University, a PhD in Educational Administration from Michigan State University, and a Master of Laws degree from York University's Os Osgoode Hall. Dr. Degonye started his relationship with Dalhousie's Schulich School of Law in 2001 when he came to give an annual lecture to second year constitutional law students on the significance of residential schools and the relationship of law and reconciliation. He has returned each year since, and in 2009, Along with Schulich School of Law professor Jennifer Llewellyn, he developed a short, intensive course on the Indian residential school settlement, the first course of its kind in a Canadian law school to take up questions of law, truth, and reconciliation. During his, vi his visits to Dalhousie, Dr. Degonye has given several public lectures to both students and the wider community. He recently agreed to serve on Dalhousie's Indigenous Advisory Council, and his long-standing relationship with the law school has provided significant inspiration and support for students, staff, and faculty members alike. One of his nominators, Schulich School of Law Professor and Chancellor's Chair in Aboriginal Law and Policy, Naomi Metallic writes, quote, being the first indigenous president of a Canadian university is no small feat. 
and Dr. Degagne is a trailblazer for those of us fellow indigenous academics. He is bringing his knowledge on healing and reconciliation to bear on the running of Nipissing University. And the institution and its students are benefiting from this." Unquote. In 2010, Dr. Degagne was awarded the Order of Ontario for his dedication to improving the health, wellness, education, and governance of Aboriginal peoples. Two years later, he received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, which honors significant achievement and contributions by Canadians. And in 2015, he was invested into the Order of Canada, recognized for his support of residential school survivors and First Nations communities, notably as the head of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. In her letter of nomination, Professor Llewellyn writes, quote, Dr. Degagne has taken seriously the importance and power of education and knowledge as a means of empowering and enabling others to succeed in efforts towards justice and reconciliation. His commitment to education reflects his conviction that learning and understanding are foundational to the work of transformation and renewed relationships for reconciliation. In his various professional roles over the past 30 years, he has advanced knowledge and understanding by supporting significant research projects and educational enterprises." Unquote. So in recognition of his inspirational leadership in working to establish a vision and the conditions for reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. I ask you, Madam Chancellor, in the name of the Senate, to bestow upon Dr. Michael de Gagne the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Thank you very much. I see you, Viola. <laughs> I could hardly wait to get to the podium to, uh, to acknowledge so many friends and, and familiar faces here. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I first want to make uh, the acknowledgement of the traditional people upon whose lands we are uh, meeting today. Thank you to the elder um, from Batchewana. And thank you to the drum. And, um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, congratulations to Dalhousie, 200th anniversary. This is a very significant time for, for you. Um, and uh, so I thank all of you for, uh, for, um, for putting on this very special event to kick off, to kick off the festivities. When my son was playing uh, lacrosse and um, um, <coughs> I had the great pleasure to do this today in front of my mother, Laura, a longtime uh, career nurse in uh, Northern Ontario, my wife, Tammy, and my son, Alex. So it's nice to have them here. Um, but when he was playing lacrosse uh, as, a, as, a, as a youngster, we always tried to tell the boys that it was as important to do, make an assist as it was a goal. Right? And so the, the phrase we used to say was, uh, when you drink the water, always thank the person who dug the well. So uh, I want to make sure that I, I thank my good friend, my colleague, um, Jennifer Llewellyn, um, working together now for 15 years 
and thanks very much for the for, for the for nominating me but to to working together I think to um, establish a real bedrock for reconciliation in the in, at the School of Law and and further to Dalhousie and thank you to Naomi Naomi Metallic also for for the nomination it's much appreciated and of course to Dean Cameron for uh, for all the support and encouragement that I've received from uh, the, the, the Faculty of Law over the years. And in the great tradition of post-secondary education in the, in, in the Atlantic, you know, there, there's so many great schools and so it's nice to see the group here with, uh, from uh, Cape Breton University and uh, my colleague Ann Barber at the back from uh, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. So welcome, welcome to all of you. Thank you. I wanted to, uh, I, get, I get my chance now to say a few words about reconciliation and, uh, um, and, and where we might go. So I'll start out with um, something that's hard to hear. And it would have been uh, in the early 1990s when uh, there was a, a meeting uh, called in, um, in Ottawa to plan Canada 125. So 25 years ago, we, we just passed Canada 150. And, um, some of you have had the good fortune to hear this speech, but I just wanted to flag it for you because it's an interesting listen. Um, a great many Aboriginal leaders and, and uh, Canadian leaders were brought together to talk about Canada 125 and in the planning. And um, one of those leaders was a person that Viola and I had the good pleasure to work with for many years, George Erasmus. And George, as a former national chief and uh, a chair of the, of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, uh, was asked the question, and I think, it, I think he caught it a little bit wrong, you know, he, he was asked the question, um, George, uh, while we're here at this meeting for Canada 125, what do you have to celebrate? What do you have to celebrate? And in a, um, in a speech, I think that, that uh, I, I've asked him years later if it was written down, he said, no, it just came from the top of my head, it's, uh, and it's out there on the internet. He said, you know, what am I going to celebrate? He said, you know, maybe I should celebrate that it took until 1959 in this country for Aboriginal people to vote. Maybe that's what I have to celebrate. Or, or maybe that I should celebrate that Aboriginal languages in this country have no legal standing. Maybe that's something that we should, we should celebrate and think about. He said, you know, when a million people in Canada are unemployed and the, un the unemployment rate starts to get, you know, sort of above five, six percent. We get very, very concerned. But he says, what do you do when 90 percent of your people are unemployed? Maybe that's what I have to celebrate. He says, why can't Aboriginal people in this country, as we celebrate Canada 125, have enough land and enough control over their lives to afford dignity? He said, I don't like what's happening in this country. He said, but what will it look like in 10 years? What will it look like in 50 years? How, he said, when we get to the year 2000, will things be different? They can't be different unless we do things differently, unless we take a new approach. So he says, what can we celebrate? He said, well, I would like to be able to celebrate Canada's leadership for the world in healing and reconciliation and, and a new relationship with Indigenous people. But he said, it will have to be different and we are sick and tired of being your conscience. Those were hard words from George and um, uh, he, I think for us, we have to ask ourselves, as you listen to that tonight, maybe on the internet, because it was uh, captured in his voice, or if you reflect on those words, we have, we have to ask ourselves, if, we, if he gave that speech today, would it still hold true? So 25, 30 years later, would it still have meaning? Would those metrics still be the same? Would our, the conditions of indigenous lives still be the same? And the answer is that although we are trying as best we can, the government of Canada finds that in the last 30 years, and this is in a report I read some months ago, that in, in trying its best in the last 30 years with the investment of billions of dollars and, and um, a lot of attention paid to programming, that the conditions of Aboriginal life are not dramatically different. We still talk about 
clean water. We still talk about enough land. We still talk about child welfare, where in most provinces, less than 10% of the children are Aboriginal, but over 60% are in the child welfare, are, 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 make up the child welfare system. What's happening? When more children today are in care of the child welfare system in Canada, Aboriginal children, than ever went to residential school. What have we learned by looking in the rearview mirror of the past? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls us to challenge us to look at our systems, look at the things, look at the systemic ways in which Aboriginal people relate to the rest of Canada. And uh, some work has been done and we have been called to act in education, in post-secondary education, in health, in the criminal justice system. But we have a lot left to do and we have now a, 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 a real challenge. So where does the light come from? Where do we, where do we see potential? Where, do, where will we be better? When we replay George's speech at Canada 175, we hope that it's dramatically different. How will we be better? <coughs> So this is the discussion that we're going to have this afternoon about education, because I believe it's at the very core of our, of our capacities to do better. Three quick points about education. I challenge us, I think, to do better earlier. We have a story that we tell Indigenous students. We said you can be anything you, can, you want to be, anything. But in Northern Ontario, where I'm from, it is rare in small communities with large groups of Indigenous students in high school, it is rare that we even offer to them courses that allow them to transition to university. They can't get there from where they are. And so we ask, why don't you want to go to university? I'd love to, but in my high school, they don't offer the courses that allow me to. And so we're always playing catch up. And I think as a society, we have to take a look at what we're promising Indigenous students, what we're promising Indigenous young people, and then offer them a very clear transition to, a, to something better, providing them access to university. I, in, in the citation, we talked about my father, the, the, uh, who came from a, a farm in northwestern Ontario, uh, and uh, I was lucky to have two parents who, were, who had university education, and um, uh, how he worked in a parts department at his family store and then decided he was going to do university education. And that first course he talked about in the church basement of the, of the church in Fort Francis, uh, allowing him access to a world that he didn't think he would ever have in remote northwestern Ontario. Same thing years later when he went into a master's program at Central Michigan University. And the reason that he had access to that program was because they came to Sudbury, where we were living at the time. And they opened up a little campus at the community college and said, we're going to offer master's degrees. And he signed up. And then he later came to me and said, you've got to take this program. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's great. And I, that's when I signed up. And that's when my graduate experience started. So never underestimate that access point, the idea that we need to start to bring education to students and, not, and spend less time having them come to us. I think we need to have greater efforts on support. We do very well promising students uh, opportunities in the universities. We can get them in the front door, but we have to take a look at how they're grad we're graduating them. Are they graduating? Do they have the support once they're inside our institutions? I think the other thing we have to look at is the danger that every Indigenous student we see needs remediation, that every one of them needs help and ignoring the ones that are excellent and are already performing at a very high standard. So we need to be both offering help and supporting and rewarding excellence. This is important and it's important to do and it's very difficult to do because you have to do it one on one. I and you have to go to those promising Indigenous students and say, we want you to come to Dalhousie University and we're going to help you get there. When I first started in uh, the, the federal government, I worked in a, in, a, in a cubicle like everybody else does. And um, next to the window, though, there was, uh, there was you could, that sort of conveys to many of you my status at the time. Uh, so um, I thought that somebody 
was going to just discover how brilliant I was and how hard a worker I was and was going to come down from the heavens and, and, uh, and, and recognize my work and help me get, get a leg up and, and, and climb the, the public sector ladder. It didn't happen for many years, oddly enough. I had to do it myself. <laughs> but uh, one, of the, um, one of the real turning points for me was, uh, and this was unbelievable at the time, for anybody who, uh, of you who have worked in government, the Deputy Minister of the Department of Indian Affairs came down from um, upstairs and uh, came looking for me. And he said, we're starting a new program for First Nations executive leaders. And uh, we need 10 people, and we'd like you to be one of them. He asked me. I en enrolled in that program. It changed everything about my life and my work trajectory. And all it took was someone who I respected and someone in authority to say, you're the one. You can do it, and we, need you to, we, we, we want you to enlist. So it, it, it absolutely life-changing. Um, and I think the last thing I'll, I'll say about education is, it, and, and reconciliation is, is that Indigenous people have a role to play here too. I, I get concerned when I see the truth and reconciliation. Uh, maybe 90 of the 94 calls to action start with, we call upon the government too. We have waited too long for the government to change our lives. And it's now time for us to take a look at enlisting the support and encouragement of non-Aboriginal people, of the rest of Can Canadian society, in helping us achieve reconciliation. I'll tell you a little story. When I um, was in university, I worked um, part-time in the summers at Via Rail Canada. And so uh, I was an operator on the phone line when you called in to make a, a train reservation anywhere in Canada. And something I highly recommend, uh, one summer I spent on the night shift, midnight to eight. And uh, it's a different world. It's a different world. In many ways, those overnight operators kind of oper we all kind of operated a lonely hearts club. <laughs> people who just needed someone to talk to across Canada, people who were lonely, people who never got out. They said, well, who can I call? And they would call us by name because there was only five of us in all of Canada. And they would call us by name and say, oh, I'd, I'd like to talk to Joe. Is he around? Yes. And I'd say, Joe, Betty's on the line. And that's, <laughs> that's how we did it. That's how we did it. And we would get the same calls from the same people. And people were very, very invested in the train. And uh, I, we would get calls that say, oh, it's John calling. Uh, it's eight minutes late out of Salmon Arm. And so you'd write that down. Now remember, this was 1982. For those of you who were not born then, there was no capacity for people to Google when the train was coming. Okay, There was no capacity. And really, most of the stations were unmanned. So we didn't, in Toronto, we didn't even know when the tr if the train was late. We'd get, and so we relied on this little informal network of people who had really no responsibility to do this but did it anyway. And I remember getting a call, I frequently received it, from a guy in northern Ontario, and he lived not too far from an unmanned station. So there's no phone in there, there's no operator, there's no way to, sit to, to let you know when the train is coming. And he would call and he'd say, how's the train coming, Mike? And I'd say, well, it's not good, it's, it's an hour and a half late out of, out of uh, you know, horn pain. And he'd say, okay, well, that's not good. There's, there's six or seven people down there at the, at the station. I'll get my wife up, we'll make sandwiches and coffee, and we'll go down there and we'll tell them it's going to be late and maybe give them a little bit to eat, because this was the middle of the night. And they're waiting, and they have no idea when it's coming. And I thought to myself uh, how impressive that was for me for a couple of reasons. First of all, that's a very generous thing to do, and it's a very kind thing to do. But it suggests something different. It, ex it suggests something higher than that, which is responsibility. It suggests that we are responsible to each other as a community, that we have to care for each other, and that there is, I believe, a tremendous wellspring of this kind of care and responsibility that is waiting for the Indigenous community in Canada. There are people who want to help, who want to reach out and feel it's their role and responsibility to do so. So I think 
the third point I make today is, is to make sure that Indigenous people look for the ways in which Canadian society, not institutions, but individuals, really wish to help. And I have to say that my, my uh, time spent with uh, the Schulich School of Law has been uh, profound. I really do feel that you are here to help, here to reach out. And uh, for those students here who are considering a, stu a, a, a career in law, look no further than this institution. We need you, we want you to come, and um, we want you to make a difference in the, in, in the lives of our communities. So thank you very much for this high honour. Uh, you, you have no idea what it means to me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike, if I may use your first name for those inspiring words. I did not ask him to put in that plug for the law school, but now that he's done it, um, I will only repeat it and encourage, encourage all of you in the same way uh, he did. Um, that concludes our ceremony for today, but before we uh, finish and um, go to lunch, I just have a few thank yous I want to make at this point. Um, first of all, of course, I want to extend a very warm thank you to the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. When we approached them with the idea that we might have this event here, we got nothing but support and encouragement and a really warm reception. Um, and I hope, as they said in that movie, the name of which escapes me now, this is the beginning of a wonderful relationship. We might be able to um, uh, replicate it with other events. So thank you very much to the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. Uh, again, I'll repeat my thanks to Elder Debbie Eisen for the smudging and the blessing, and of course to Eastern Eagles for performing the drumming and the honor song. I want to uh, also again thank Cape Breton University for being our collaborators um, uh, in this event, and especially with regard to the collaboration uh, for this afternoon's symposium, Reconciliation in Education. I will say a particular thank you to Elizabeth Sanford and Christina Coakley. Any time an event like this happens, you know there are always some people there who do a lot of hard work, and without it, the event would not have happened. So I want to mention them in particular. Um, and finally, to everyone here, to the platform party, and to each one of you for uh, joining this event and for being a part of it. We really do appreciate you being here. Um, we look forward to as many of you as possible uh, participating in the afternoon symposium. Um, that concludes the ceremony. You're now invited to join us for lunch, and we look forward to having a chance to chat with as many of you as possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>